The gospel comes to us today from John chapter 14, starting from the first verse. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can you say we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, and the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you, had, if you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him, and you have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our gospel reading starts with, let not your hearts be troubled. So a little bit of context to this. Jesus is saying all of this on Maundy Thursday in the upper room. This is the night that Jesus is betrayed. And as he's with his disciples, he tells them three very troubling things in chapter 13. The first of which is he says, uh, one of you, one of the 12 of you is going to betray me. That means there's a, a traitor in their midst. One of them's going to betray Jesus. Another thing Jesus says is Peter, who's basically the president of them, he's the highest of them, he says, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows. And then he says, and then I'm going to go somewhere and you guys can't follow me. And so Jesus says these three kind of troubling things. And in the midst of this, the disciples have to be confused. They're asking themselves questions. What's going to happen tonight? What's about to happen maybe to us? Are we going to be okay? Is this a safe place? Is Jerusalem going to be a safe place for us? Or are we going to have to get far, far out of here? Sarah and I now, we've been living here for about 10 months. And we've recently been asking people, why did you move to Santa Clarita? And we've picked up on a couple of themes, about three themes. And one of them is, you know, we used to live down in the valley. And it's crowded there, a little bit of crime there. So we wanted to move up to Santa Clarita. It's safer there. So that's why we moved to Santa Clarita. We've also heard from other people. We moved to Santa Clarita because we wanted to start a family. And we knew Santa Clarita, it's a family-friendly place. And it's a good place to raise kids. That's why we moved to Santa Clarita. And the third thing that we've heard oftentimes is, you know, we lived in Los Angeles, and we didn't want our kids to be raised in LAUSD, so we moved up here for the school system. Uh, Sarah and I, we can totally resonate with all of these. Uh, about 10, well, more than 10 months ago, over a year ago, uh, I was in the interview process for this call, and Sarah and I, we only had one vehicle at the time. So we drove up, we would drive up together for the interviews, and I was, I was interviewing, Sarah would go out and she'd go shopping in the local areas. Then after our interview, we'd get into the car and we'd just drive around and look at, you know, if we get called here, where might we live? Uh, what's this place like? So we're driving around, we're driving, I think, down Tournament Road uh, one of these times, and we're looking around and we see people out walking, the whole family's walking, they're walking their dogs, 
They have their kids with them. And people out walking in the middle of the day. And we say to ourselves, and they, they don't look homeless. We're from San Pedro, so that's definitely not the case for me. If you're walking out in the middle of the day, uh, you probably don't have anywhere, anywhere to go. So anyway, uh, that's what we noticed. We noticed this seems like a family-friendly place. We could start a family here. Uh, we could raise a, a good family and be safe here. It seemed that Santa Clarita guaranteed safety of several kinds. One, physical safety, but also mental and intellectual safety uh, for our, our kids. And so uh, now, it's about 10 months later that we've been living here, and we're looking to dig deep and, and grow some roots in this area. So we're looking to maybe buy in the not-so-distant future, and now we're talking with our real estate agent, I'm talking with other people who've lived here for a while, and we've been hearing uh, a lot of different input. One of them is, there's a street named Jake's Way. Stay away from there. Okay. There's certain pockets of Santa Clarita where there's multiple gangs running through there. Stay away from there. Okay. Uh, someone told us about a school that's recently starting to accept and push an ideology that we're not comfortable with Addie being exposed to at a young age. And it's like, oh. And so with these three things compounded on one another, we're kind of asking ourselves, is this going to be a safe place for us? Or are we going to have to get far away from here? What Jesus does in the midst of these troubles, ours and the disciples, as he comes in and he says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. This then is the antidote to fear that no matter what our troubles, we have a God in whom we can believe in and trust in because why? He's preparing a home for us. He's preparing a room for us in the Father's house. Something that's permanent. Something that's long-lasting. And so no matter what happens on the ground beneath our feet, we have roots dug deep for us, high in the sky, up in heaven for us. Something that's permanent, something that's going to outlast any lease that we have in, on any rental, something that's not going to have to be rebuilt like a fixer-upper, and something that's going to outlast any, any new build that you might have bought in the last 10 years. That's going to be permanent. And so I, I really hope Jesus is a good interior designer because you're going to spend a long time there. What this does is it gives you sustainability that no matter what troubles happen here on this earth, no matter what might happen to you here, it's temporary. It's momentary. So when you're up in heaven and you look back at your earthly life, you're going to see a long future ahead of you in a beautiful place, in a good place in a safe place, and you're going to look back and see that was so momentary. Jesus gives us sustainability through faith in him. We've got a home for us in the Father's house. I think John is using a double entendre in this passage. So we're talking about the Father's house. We have a heavenly home for us that Jesus promises us uh, when we pass away and we get to be with the Father face to face. I think he's also picking up on another theme here, too. Anytime you do Bible study, you might want to do a word study or look for certain themes. And what you do when you do that is, in this passage, you might want to figure out, what in the world is this Father's house? So what you do is you look at that theme or look at that phrase, and you look for it in other places in Scripture. If you do that, one place you'll land is Luke chapter 10, or Luke chapter 2. And in Luke chapter 2, you're face-to-face -face with boy Jesus. 12-year-old Jesus in the temple. His mother and father lost him. They're, they're already on their way home. And they realize Jesus isn't with us. And so they hurry back to Jerusalem. And once they get to Jerusalem, they look at the temple. And here's Jesus. He's surrounded by these scribes and Pharisees, people who know the religion really well. And he's baffling them. His understanding is beyond his age. And they're amazed at him. So Mary comes up to Jesus and says, where have you been? We've been worried about you. Why would you do this to us? And what Jesus says is, 
did you not know that I must be in my father's house? What the father's house is the temple. The temple is where the manifest presence of God is at this time. So people come to the temple to pray, to offer sacrifices, because they're, they know they're going to be right with God. I am really close to God if I'm in the temple courts. And also when you, if people aren't near the temple, they'll know the direction of where the temple is and face that direction when they pray. Uh, so the temple is the manifest presence of God. The temple also has many layers to it. Right at the center, you have this place called the Holy of Holies. And this place is so special that only one certain person, the high priest, could go there once a year to make sacrifices. Then as you go to each layer outside of that, there's other special preparations that you have to make. One of them is you must be, you must be clean. You have to go through ceremonial purification. Other layers are for other people. If you're not born the right, right gender, if you're not born male, Female, you have to be farther out. If you're not born a Jew, you have to be even farther out. So there's these layers that keep you from the, the manifold presence of God here at the center. And what Jesus is saying, I'm going to make a room for you in that temple. I'm going to make a room for you in the Father's house. I'm going to prepare this. How does Jesus do this? He does this in the cross. So this is the night that Jesus is betrayed. The next day is Good Friday. Jesus is hung on the cross and he dies for us. And as soon as he dies for us, there's an earthquake. And in the temple, it says that the, the curtain that separated the Holy of Holies from the other places of the sanctuary is 30 feet tall and 30 feet wide, rips from top to bottom. What then happens is those unclean, non-Jewish people can see right into the Holy of Holies. What's happening here is God is on the loose. He's no longer contained in this one special place, but now he has free reign, and people have access to God through Jesus Christ. And so what Jesus says is, believe in me, and the preparations have already been made. What the Father's house then isn't necessarily the temple then. The, the Father's house is the gracious gaze of our Heavenly Father. At the end of the service, we give the benediction that says, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. This is God's gracious gaze on you. And so before the death of Christ, before the preparations that Jesus made on your behalf, We've been sinking down beneath God's righteous frown, but Jesus laid aside his crown so that it might be well with your soul, that you might be in the presence of God, unhindered, unveiled, that you might be face to face with God. This is the Father's house, that you wouldn't have shame when coming to him. You wouldn't have guilt anymore in coming to him, because all the preparations have been made for you. You don't have to be a certain kind of person. That Jesus takes you, and he makes you clean through his preparations. Jesus then, he's, he says, uh, someone asks him, well, what's the way to, to the Father? We don't know how you're getting there. We don't know where you're going. And what Jesus says to him is, he says, I am the way and the truth and the life. The way to the Father then isn't a 10-step program. You do these 10 steps, and then you can make it to the Father. It's not a road that you make a pilgrimage on. It's not a set of rules that you have to follow. It's not a set of commandments that you can't break. But rather, the way to the Father is now a person. It's not a thing. It's not a process. It's a person, the person of Jesus Christ. And in Jesus saying this, what he's then doing is making an exclusive claim. There's an exclusivity to this. Many people find this offensive. There's only one way to the Father? There's only one way to heaven? I don't think so. I think there's many ways to the Father. It's unkind for you to say that there's only one way. And my response is to that is that, yeah, there's one way, but I mean, it's a great fact that there even is a gracious 
way. I think if you think it's unkind to say that, what you don't realize is the gravity and the weight of your own sin. What you've, been in, what you've inherited from your earthly mother and father, the sins that you've committed yourself, what this does is it separates us from God. God is all holy, all perfect, perfectly holy and wholly perfect. The slightest infraction on our part then separates us. We're no longer perfect. And God can't be in the presence of this. But what Jesus does is he makes a way. He himself is the way and the truth and the life. And he's made the preparations that close that divide between us and the Father. And so it's by the grace of God now that we do have a way. All other ways that other people have proposed, hard word, uh, are really unkind ways. What separates Christianity from other religions, other spiritualities, is that we have a distinction between what we call the law and what we call the gospel. The law is uh, what you're commanded to do. It's the Ten Commandments. It's something that starts with, you shall do this or you shall not do this. It's a list of steps that you must take. It's a list of commandments you must keep and not break. Uh, it's, it's trying to earn your way up to God. And the unique thing about the Christian faith is that's not the way to the Father. It's not the way to the Father's gracious gaze. The way to the Father is simply through faith in Christ. At our prior congregation, I taught catechism or confirmation, and I'd have the kids uh, summarize law and gospel. And I'd say, summarize the law in one or two words. And they'd say, do or don't do. It's like, good. Okay, summarize the gospel for me. And they'd say, done. In the person and work of Jesus Christ. When you believe in Jesus Christ, all things are already done for you. And you can be in the gracious presence of God the Father. And so Jesus is the way to the Father. And it's an exclusive claim. But it's a claim that you receive by faith in Christ. What Jesus then does through faith is that he now indwells us. So there's a, in this passage, when it talks about there's many rooms in the Father's house. What, it, there's a special Greek word for that, for rooms or dwelling places. And it's not used very many times in the New Testament. In fact, in John, it's only used in two places. And they're both in the same chapter, in chapter 14. One of them is Jesus saying, I'm going to prepare a a dwelling place for you in the Father's house. The other place is about 10 verses later, in I think verse 23, where it says that God the Father and Jesus Christ are going to make their dwelling place in you. That the Father is going to dwell in you. There's not more of an, an intimate relationship right there. That as you dwell in the Father's house in his gracious presence, God also dwells in you through faith. And so God is then nearer to you than you are to your very self. Uh, God is so close to you in this that he's in you. There's an inner penetration happening here that as you dwell in the Father's house and the Father now dwells in you. This is then how Jesus says, uh, I do great things, but you're going to do even greater things because I'm going to dwell in you. I'm going to send my Holy Spirit into you to, to do many great things. This far in this sermon, I've uh, committed kind of a grave sin today. Today's Mother's Day, and I've only talked about the Father. <laughs> Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> but if there's, a, if there's a Heavenly Father, is there also a mother? Uh, the tradition of the church is, has been to say that the church is the mother. And I think the great thing about mothers is there's certain attributes that only mothers have. They're very nurturing, very caring. They're loving in a way that dads are, are dads just love differently and moms lo- love differently. And I think this is, this is the picture of the church too. 
that the church welcomes us in with love through Jesus Christ, that the, the mother church has a healing presence and a healing embrace to her, that mother church actually alleviates shame, that when you come to mother church, she receives you, she accepts you, she brings you in, she loves you. And that's the, the prayer, really, for the church, that the church would be this presence. Now, many people have been hurt by the church. Uh, this is an unfortunate fact, that people have come into the church and received more shame than they did outside the doors of the church. That people have been hurt by the church. This is sad. But that's not what the church is supposed to be. It's unfortunate when that happens. It's painful when that happens. But that's not Jesus' vision for Mother Church. Jesus' vision for Mother Church is that she would be nurturing, that she would draw people into her embrace, that she would point people to the Father. This is what the church is, is meant to be, that the church wouldn't be heavy-handed with the law, that we wouldn't be ruled by legalism here in the church, but that people would be received in grace and that grace would be extended to every sinner who walks through the doors of the church and that shame wouldn't be placed on people who walk through the doors of the church. And so this is what the church is meant to be, but only through Christ, the, bride, the, the, the bridegroom of the church, that gives the church that power. As we say, it's only by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit that that nurturing presence of Mother Church is possible. And so would it be that way with this church here? Would we be a church that wouldn't be heavy with legalism? Would we be a church that's nurturing? Would we be a church that wouldn't poison people with, with gossip? Would we be a church that's healing and embracing and would be loving to all who walk through, these, through the doors of this church? That's what Jesus wants for, her, for his church. Let's pray. God, thank you for these great, great promises that you've prepared a home for us. That we don't have to worry about what happens here on earth because it's temporary. You've got something that's much longer lasting for us. You've given us yourself. And the way you've paved the way was through your death. Thank you for such costly love. That you loved us so much that you would go to the depths of our depravity to save us. Thank you, Jesus, for this grace. I pray that you pour out your grace on us today. That you pour out your grace on this congregation. That we would be that ideal church. The church without blemish. The church that, that receives in love and grace that would point to you who's the way, the truth, and the life. And so, G Jesus, give us the ability to do this. Give us your grace to do this. I pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen.